Hello, and welcome to the next series of webinars from Paratech Incorporated. My name is Nigel Ellaby. I'm the training manager of Paratech, and I'm here to introduce the speaker for today. My name is Nigel Ellaby. Uh, the speaker the for today is uh, Lieutenant Tyler Gelati from Ford College of Colorado. My name is Nigel Ellaby. Uh, He's going to be uh, talking to you today on heavy Tyler Gelati stabilization and some calculations that he's uh, brought together for us. And I hope you enjoy it's this uh, quiet, webinar. Uh, this is the start of 2023, so quiet. Happy New Year. Uh, we hope to get a bunch of these in throughout the year as a reference for you guys in the field. So with that, I'm gonna hand this over to Tyler Gelati. Tyler, take it away. Thank you, Nigel. Um, as I said before, uh, my name is Tyler Gelati. I work at Fort Collins, Colorado. Uh, and spent majority Thank of my career on, um, um, on support for equipment. Uh, my name is Tyler Gelati, and, and I just moved uh, rest, recently moved and over to majority of my career Nigel. on um, uh, our new heavy rescue. On support, yeah. and I'm a lieutenant there now. So the things that we're going to talk about today is we're going to talk mainly based on strut theory and strut uh, application how to implement them with angles and our strapping. One of the things that we're gonna to have to look at is as our objectives is we're gonna talk about approach to big rig accidents. We're gonna use the five step Billy Leach process to do that. Some of the things that we're gonna start out in the front is the first three steps of the Billy Leach five step process, the big rig um, are gonna be just so that we understand with each other how we're gonna to get to the lifting portion. This class is primarily a lifting class. We're gonna talk about struts, strapping, chaining, and we're gonna talk about theory-based stuff with it. Now, this is a two-part series lecture, and this two-part series lecture is gonna give us, in this first part, the theory of it. And what we're hoping to do is we're gonna take the boys from Michigan, um, from USAR, we've got Greg Pryor, uh, Aaron Osborne, and Carl Hine, who are absolute geniuses when it comes to heavy lift, and we're gonna come back on that two part series, hopefully, and we're gonna prove the theory based um, process that we're looking at. We're gonna look at friction coefficients. We're gonna look at different things that are gonna help us make sure that we are on the right track in theory. And we wanna take mathematics and practicality and combine them together so that we know we have the proper um, fundamental ideas on how to share with you. With, to share with you. So, some of the things about big rig is when we look at this incident, you know, when I teach this class, and this class is mainly taught in the field, I teach a lot in the field. I don't do a whole lot of classroom courses with it. So I, I'm able to turn to the side and look at a big rig and say, what would you say if you came to this call? And a lot of people have the whole theory of like, oh no, oh boy, this is not good. What we want to do is really talk to you guys about the systematic process that five-step process to big rig so that when you approach these type of calls you can literally as a company work through it step by step and not have the old boy feeling in your stomach and that pit when you hear a big rig call come up so when we talk about the five-step theory process or five-step systematic process oh, of big rig what we're looking at is identifying the load stabilizing the larger vehicle lowering the smaller vehicle lifting the larger vehicle and separating and extricating now it's very important to work through these steps and one of the biggest things to do is identify the load when we talk about heavy lifting we talk about identifying a heavy lift anytime we move shift, lift or push anything that's heavy we want to know what it weighs some of the other things we're going to look at is what grade it's on grades are a big deal we're not going to spend a whole lot of time but it's something i want you to understand that when i put in a grade to an, to an incident, I have weight distribution downhill, uphill, whatever it might be to the side, I want you to guys to recognize that there is a grade and there's additional physics that are put into the load. The next thing is the angle. Now, when we look at loads, we look at angles of things. Angles can help us and can hurt us. And so that's part of identifying what angle is this big rig resting at? And the next thing is the weight. What does it weigh? Now, there's a system that we all have seen. It's a standardized chart of heavy vehicle rigs that you'll see within the internet and any big rig class you go to. And basically what it does is it tells you what to add per axle of a, of a semi-trailer 
so you can walk up on scene and you can recognize what it weighs. Right here in this one to the left, this white picture, you're going to see that it says 17,000 pounds per axle. And then you're going to see the different weight is going to be up at the tractor portion of this. And you're going to see that that tractor is at 12,000 pounds. Now, those can change based on what type of camp, you know, if it's a sleeper, if it's a haul, a toy hauler plus a sleeper. So that All those things Nigel, change. how many people those have logged on? Be, um, what type of camp, you know, if it's a sleeper. Interchangeable based on weight. You're going to also see hauler. extended cabs. You're going to see uh, <clears throat> pup trailers. You're going to see a whole bunch. But things are drop axles. What we want you to do is just add what, those you know, those tandems of those axles I got you together now. to get the final load. Um, for this is 17,000 pounds, and we see a lot of people that talk about just okay. putting the 20,000 pounds too, that's a lot in the middle of the night, people you just are start ra ra you know, rattling off by yeah, 20s Spain, and getting New all Jersey, things you Portugal, need Miami, and the weights. But we're going to work with 17s Florida. mainly for this portion of the class. Uh, the next thing you see on the right is just the class Indiana, 1 through 8. Yeah. It's important for you to just kind of recognize those, understand what's in your district. For you know, When we look at our class eights that are anything that's 33,000 and above and, and over in weight, those are important to know, um, to recognize when you arrive on these incidents. For example, some of the things you see in a cement truck or a dump truck or a garbage truck, all those are important. And it's, it's important for you to understand when they're loaded and when they're not loaded when you start running these calls. For example, for me in my district, my dump is to the west of my district. Now, the west of my district, I know that if I'm running a call and this dump truck is traveling west from the hours of uh, 12 o'clock to 1 o'clock, they're going for their first dump, so they're probably fully loaded. If they're traveling east away from the dump, I know that they probably just got done dumping, and so they're just going to be primarily just the vehicle, not a load in it as well. And, you know, same thing is at nighttime, I know my dump closes at 430 in our district, and our city trash, our, our trash trucks, are moving to the dump and you know closer to four o'clock to make their dumps and, and that's important for me to know that they're loaded and that's some of the things i take into account a loaded and unloaded dump um the next thing we want to talk about is angles now when people look at these wrecks when they get on scene of these wrecks and you see this big rig up on its side what we end up having people think is, like, oh, boy, this is not good. But in reality, it's so much better to have things pushed at angles. When I look at this chart that I draw, and you're going to see a lot of drawings from me in this class. These, these, the reality is I'm not computer savvy, so I have to draw things on whiteboards, take pictures of them, and put them in this PowerPoint and have somebody help me get it all organized. So you're going to see some of these drawings. This is kind of the way that I teach in the field, so bear with me. When you look at this drawing on the right, you're going to see that there is an angle chart there on the, on the lower right side of that uh, picture. And when we put things at angles, we actually reduce the load of what we're trying to pull and what we're trying to pull. Because the load transfers to a pivot point. So when we look at this truck that's up on its side, that's up on a wheel, the pivot point is the wheel. And the load is being distributed to the bottom of that wheel, to that pivot point. And it's sitting at approximately probably a 30 degree angle. So when we look at a hinge lift, and that's something that we talk about, when we start moving things on hinges, we start reducing the load on our push. So right here on this right hand side, you'll see that it says, um, it'll say zero degrees right here down the bottom. You see the 15 and right below it, zero degrees. So at zero degrees, I'm going to be hinge lifting. I'm going to lift half of this load. And then as I come up to 15 degrees, I'm going to lift 75% of that load. So if this was a 20, a 40,000 pound uh, dump truck here and we were going to lift it, well, I know that at the bottom I'm hinge lifting half of 40,000 pounds. So I'm going to be lifting just 20,000 pounds as a lift if it was flat on the ground. As it comes up to, seven, up to 15 degrees, I'm going to be lifting 75% of, of half that load. So now I'm already at 15,000 pounds at 15 degrees. And now when I come up to 30 degrees, I'm going to lift half of that load. So now I'm only lifting 10,000 pounds of that 20,000 pounds. And as I get to 45 degrees, I'm only living, lifting 25% of half. So now I'm just lifting 5,000 pounds. And as it starts coming up, it starts getting less and less, 12.5. So now I'm only lifting 2,500 pounds. And then when I get to 75 degrees, I'm only lifting... 2.5% of half the load. So now I'm only lifting 500 pounds. 
So, and it's as this load transfers, that comes up into neutral. It's just like a ladder. So when we think about picking up a ladder in a fire service, we take it a 40 foot ladder and we pick it up off the ground. It's heavy at first. And as soon as we push that weight into the pivot point, which are the spurs of that ladder, it starts coming up. And as that ladder comes up, it branches into neutral. And then once it sits in neutral, that ladder can stay in neutral and it doesn't move left or right. It doesn't have lateral left or right forces. It's all an axial load. And then as it then turns back through neutral, it starts gaining its load back the other way, the same way that it, you know, lost its load. So it's gaining um, 2.5%, 12.5%, 25%, 50% of 50s, you know, 75% of 50 until then it's back on the ground and it's actually half the load again. So that's the hinge. And then the next thing about the hinge lift that people forget to think about is they will say, I'm going to hinge lift this vehicle. And then they don't recognize the fact that they actually have to be at the end of that lever. So when we look at this, that 25% that's added on in the red and the actual drawing of that vehicle, we see that primary center gravity line. That's where if I was to pick the vehicle up right there, I would have the whole load. And as I start moving away from that center of gravity, I start getting closer towards the end of that, that hinge, that, that lever. But what will happen is we'll see in these classes, people say, oh, I'm going to hinge lift it. And they'll come up in front of those dualies and they'll put a hydrofusion in there. Not that the hydrofusion can't handle that lift, but we, what we want to do is have the theory of understanding that we're actually adding 25% back to that vehicle when we start jumping in front of the tire. We start reducing our lever and so we're adding weight back to our strut calculations when we start looking at things when we start getting into strut calculations we just have to understand that that's what happens so the next slide is just from the rec master uh, handbook as you can see it's the same thing you can see in this top blue one we have a 32,000 000 pound um, box truck and as it's being hinge lifted it's only 16,000 000 pounds and then it goes down at 15 degrees to 12,000. As it goes to 30 degrees, it goes to 8,000, which is your half of half right there. And then 45 to 4,000, and then so forth. It just reduces as it comes back up until neutral. And then it's, it doesn't have weight laterally. It's now just vertical load. Go ahead and lift it. The, sem the bus on the bottom is the same. It's just pictures to illustrate better than what I can do in my own drawings. So now we have weight, grade, weight uh, angle, and now we're going to look at grade. Obviously, when we come up on something that's on the right here, this white uh, day tra uh, tractor with the semi back, is that that load is actually wanting to push downhill. So we just have to take into consideration when we're building our lifting plan that if I was to try to push or pull it, I know that the load is going to want to go downhill onto the struts that I put down on the bottom of this. Um, this semi truck, and I just have to take that into consideration when I start looking at my identification of load. So, the next part, step two in the five step process, is stabilize the larger vehicle. Now, this is really important. There's a lot of, uh, you, you would have heard it as stop the crush. Well, that could be a possibility. But when I look at it, I look at the stabilizing the larger vehicle as the most important part for when we do step three, which is lowering the smaller vehicle. Because if we lower a vehicle, obviously the larger vehicle will continue to crush down onto it. This is literally just stabilizing the larger vehicle for step uh, three. But step two is very important. What ends up happening is we put in struts just to stabilize. And sometimes what can happen is we can put those struts in what we call the premier lifting position. And what we want to do is train on the idea of when we start approaching these incidents, we put in a strut that is in the right position for the lift. So if I'm going to stabilize and I come up with my heavy rescue, my first strut into the scene will probably be my hydrofusion, and I'll put it in a lifting position, and I'll also use it as a temporary capture strut for step three. So it's just important to train on those. So once we have the top larger vehicle stabilized and we know that it's not going to move at all and come down, then we can do step three. So now step three is lower the smaller vehicle. So 
So I put a few slides on here. It's important to not only lower the small vehicle in step three, but understand step five. So what we see when we teach these classes is we'll see a lot of people that will get into the incident or the scenario that we set up for them and they can't get the strap over the top of the hood. What we want to do is just show you a couple quick things that you can do. We want people to understand you can always tie back to the vehicle, to the body, which is showing that um, in the school bus picture where the school bus has the ratchet strap that's actually tied back to the vehicle, the body of that school bus to hold the suspension. That can happen in the middle picture as well. I could come around the eight post if I needed to and then ratchet on an independent ratchet, ratchet that uh, suspension down if I needed to so that I didn't have to sit there and mess around with trying to weave a ratchet strap through the wreckage of what I'm looking at. And then the next thing is I put a, a picture of a tire and it has a cross in the middle of it and then two X's on the left. Now this tire will be moving in the directions of the arrows. If I was to ratchet onto this tire and I was to put a ratchet strap in those two black X's of that um, upper left quadrant and lower left quadrant, as this tire was to rotate around, it will release the ratchet strap for step five. So that uh, remove and extricate step this is important to recognize that if i'm going to remove it i'm going to pull the this vehicle backwards i want to put the ratchet in a position that tightens down the strap instead of releases the strap so that's just something to think about so lowering the smaller vehicles now that we've identified the load we've stabilized the bigger vehicle we've lowered the smaller vehicle and this is a point where we can take also what i tell people is we're looking this is a game of less than inches sometimes for clearance so if i have clearance at this point i might be at a stage where i would remove an extra gear. but if i'm not there and i don't have the clearance then i have to start looking at the lift now this is the primary portion of this class this is the bread and butter of i feel the reason why this class is even is um is on here today so some of the things we're going to look at is we're going to talk about struts so when i teach this class i take this uh, paratech and I'll stand it straight up and I'll tell the people in the class to say I'm going to take the strut and it's vertically it's in a vertical position just like like this and I'm going to pressurize that strut I'm going to put a hundred pounds vertically in that strut how much pressure or how much does that strut see in force and everyone will say well it sees a hundred pounds that's that's correct it does it sees 100 pounds the next thing I do is I take that strut and I put it at an angle and I tell people, okay, I'm going to press at an angle. I'm going to push at 100 pounds on the strut. Does this strut see more or less load? Well, this is a time frame where people aren't always 100% sure. I'll hear more load, less load. I'll see a bunch of different uh, or hear a bunch of different answers. But there, you know, a lot of time at this point where everybody's kind of catching on to uh, strut forces, they'll say you'll see more load. Well, the question is why? Well, it's because we're creating a vector. And that vector is that magnitude and direction. It's two properties. It's magnitude and direction in different directions. And so when I pressurize and I put something at an angle, I create a direction. And a direction is in sometimes referred to as a degree. So I put this at 70 degrees and I put a direction into it. Well, I put more forces into my strut. I have lateral forces and I have vertical forces and I'm creating a vector. And for some people, it's easier for them to understand that it's just like ropes. And that's why I have a picture of this, uh, these omni pulleys in here is that those are directional pulleys or a change of direction for some. When I put a change of direction in the rope, we're, what happens? Well, my anchor sees more load. Same thing happens. I have directional, I have magnitude, and so therefore I'm creating an a vector which creates an increase in forces. So now understanding that when we put things at angles, we create vectors. But for struts, it's much like if we think about rakers. As I put something at a lower angle, so I reduce my angle. So we look at this diagram and each one of these has a six foot insertion. So everyone has a six foot insertion. The first one's at 60 degrees. And so I know what that adjacent 
angle is to um, the A side, but 60 degrees, and then I look at, okay, look at that hypotenuse. That hypotenuse isn't very long. And then as I go over to 45 degrees, I see that that hypotenuse becomes longer in moment. And as I go to 30 degrees, that hypotenuse gets even longer in moment. Well, what happens is as things, um, as things get more long, when these struts get longer, when they're seeing force, as we said, like before, we know that they're at angles and they get more force because of the vector. Well, the longer that moment is, the more force there's going to be. So we've got to figure out how much force is on that vertical axial load strut at six feet. And then we're going to have to find out how much force becomes part of the strut as it gets put in shallower and shallower angles. This formula that we're going to talk about is really what we just were talking about in a second ago, but this is the force constant formula. So just to start, when we look at this drawing on the blue side, everything in this drawing is completely level. There is no grade and there is no angle. This is a 40,000 pound box truck that we're going to hinge lift from the back and we're going to get 20,000 pounds on that hinge lift. Right, we reduced, we're doing a, a zero degree hinge lift, so we're just going half the load of the hinge lift. I'm going to put a strut on either side of that box strut. So, where that you see that diagonal line, that's the strut, and there would be one on the other side. They're both going to be six foot insertions, and it's going to be 20,000 pound lift. So, I'm going to divide each side, I'm going to give each strut 10,000 pounds. So, now that I have this side, so we're going to now just look at one side of that strut. We're going to look at that line there. We have a six foot insertion and 10,000 pounds. So, I want to find in a vertical configuration how much weight is in each inch of that six foot strut. So, I'm going to take that load, that 10,000 pound load, and I'm going to divide it by six feet in inches, which is 72 inches, and I'm going to get 138 pounds. So now I have about 138 pounds as a force constant per inch. Now this kind of goes, this is a, in a vertical load. So then when we go back, we start looking, okay, so as I put it in an angle, my hypotenuse gets longer. Therefore, my load has to become more. If, if, if I'm adding into my strut and I'm adding 138 pounds per inch, well, then my strut is going to start seeing more load the longer it gets at angle. So here is. The mathematics of something so we're going to talk about when we go to lift something we want to lift it anywhere from 60 to 90 degrees that is considered a great lifting angle when we want to stabilize something we want to stabilize it from 45 to 60 degrees now we're going to talk about the benefits of that and we're going to talk about the pitfalls of it as well but what we're going to do is we're going to prove some mathematics first and we're going to talk about how our strapping has to match our loads and how when we start picking angles, we have to pick specific angles and we have to get out of the idea of how we do things and really start looking at the theory of why we do it. And so now that we're taking the theory of it and when we run these incidents, we take theory-based um, applications. And so now we're not just stamping away at what people taught us. What I want people to start doing in the fire service, especially in rescue, is have a theoretical understanding of why you're doing it. If it doesn't make sense why you're doing it, well then go out and research a, a better way to do it. So this is kind of what we, what we looked at is we saw um, a 75 degree angle, which is a great lifting angle. And so what you'll see up here, we'll kind of break this slide down. Right here I have a 75 degree angle right underneath it you see something that looks kind of like a raker chart from uh, the um, structural collapse guide from Army Corps of Engineers. So what we did is we wanted to make one for 75 degrees so we could plug some numbers in and get some answers. Well, on the upper left-hand side, that's how we found that chart, that found that uh, diagram. We used, um, Katoa, we used trigonometry essentially to figure out our rise, run, and slope. So the mathematics on the top left is just how we got this chart. So what this chart is basically is telling us for every foot of rise I have, I have 3.21 inches of run and I have 12.4 inches of slope. And the ones, the one foot, two foot, three foot, they're on the left-hand side of that um, 
that diagram are, are units. So for every unit I have, I have 12.4 inches as well. So moving back over to this big rig here that we're seeing with the 10,000 pounds on each door, this is the same diagram as we dealt with before, this whole thing. That's the same mathematical equation. I'm just taking an arbitrary six foot insertion, not that it's good or bad, I'm just using six feet. And I'm taking that 10,000 pounds and I'm dividing it by 72 inches. And I'm getting that force constant of 138. So I know that every inch of strut will have 138 pounds. Well, now I've got to find out what my force constant is, what my strut's force. So I have a six foot insertion and I know that my units of multiplication is 12.5 per foot. So I'm going to take six times 12.5 and I'm going to get 74.4 inches. Now my strut just went from 72 inches to 74.4. I'm going to multiply that by 138.8, and I'm going to get 10,332 pounds. So my strut just increased from 332 pounds. Now, not a big deal. Not a big deal in any way. Because we have to understand that Paratech is extremely strong. And so if I come over here to 74, that's just over 6 feet in between 6 and 7, I know that on a 2 to 1 safety factor, I have 28,000 pounds of capacity in that strut and if i'm in rescue i have 28,000 pounds if i'm in recovery i would move it all the way down i still have 14,125 pounds of capacity in that strut which is more than efficient for you know it's extremely efficient we got it struts good the next thing we're going to look at is strapping so when we look at strapping we look at strapping from the load to the anchor of it or the connection point and so when we look at this orange strapping line that's underneath that big rig up top we want to know from that tire to that connection point of that base what that load is going to be or what it creates so i know that i have a six foot insertion and when i come to my handy chart over here i'm just going to multiply for every foot of height that i have of insertion i have 3.21 inches of run so six times 3.21 gives me 19.2 so I have 19.2 inches, and I'm going to multiply that by our force constant because it's the generator of force. And I'm going to multiply it by 138, and I'm going to get 2,649 pounds. Okay, so now my strut is creating on one side 2,649 pounds. Now the theoretical based idea is that if one side and one side buttress is creating that force, well, the other side buttress from the load is creating the force as well, because they're both picking up 10,000 pounds independently using the same strapping system for, um, for uh, tension. So what we're going to see, and you see here, it says on the bottom, if each strut creates this force, you will see bidirectional forces. So I don't just see 2,649 pounds in one direction. I see 2,649 pounds in both directions, which is increasing my force strap to 5,299 pounds. Well, the question is, is this true? It is to its way. In a certain point, it is. If I can get rid of friction on the planet, then yes, it would be. So friction is one of the reasons why it's not true. We will have friction everywhere. The other thing we're going to talk about is lateral force to axial force compression so overhead axial force on lateral force basically quiets lateral force from actually happening and we're going to see that in our steeper angles and we're going to talk about why insertion angles is so important and lateral force or lateral force to axial force compression is primarily one of the biggest reasons why it is so when we look at friction friction can change based on the two planes it's just essentially the amount of interaction of friction between two surfaces. Now we could go through and we can look at our friction of force equals mu times our force of normal uh, friction, and we can come up with the mathematics. This is not gonna happen on scene, we all know that. So this is the portion that our boys from Michigan are gonna really help with. You know, Greg, Greg Payer is gonna look at this, Aaron Osborne, Carl Kine, we're all going to look at this. We're going to try to find what it is that our steel base plates react with on friction, on asphalt, on ice, on concrete, on highways, on whatever surfaces. We're going to look at multiple surfaces and come up with friction coefficients. Now, there already are friction coefficients, but 
for every you know friction coefficient you find, it's specific to steel and a specific type of steel. So I really just looked at just the steel to asphalt friction coefficient that you can find in any rigging guide um, that you can buy. And I found steel to asphalt coefficient of friction coefficient of 0 0.70. So we'll just look at what friction does. You know, and friction and rescue can either do two things. It can help you and it can hurt you. But in this situation, it can really help us. We're looking at friction to helping us. So when we take this look, we take this 0 0.70. Well, I'm going to take the 5,299 pounds of lateral force that our 75 degree angle struts are creating, and I'm going to multiply them by 0 0.70, and that's going to give me 3,709. Well, I'm going to multiply. I'm going to subtract that out because that friction is reducing that force, that amount of force. So I'm going to subtract that out from the 5,000. 299 pounds, and that's going to give me 1,589. Now, my force just went down, my lateral force just went down from 5,299 to 1,589 on asphalt and steel interactions of two centimeters. So I only have 794 pounds traveling in both directions when I divide it. So the things that we're going to talk about is when we look at people that talk about strapping. Now I got to find strapping. We'll talk about it a little bit in just a minute, but when we talk about how much strapping people have been putting on big rig um, uh, incidences, and you know, we've talked about, we'll see people with 80 grade, 100 grade, 120, 120 P wag. We'll see this chain coming out and chain binders and all this stuff. And we're getting into the strapping. The strapping is becoming almost the most important part when you go to these classes and you talk to people. We're going to show to you that strapping really isn't everything. It's more of a understanding of why and when you're going to strap heavy and why and when you don't have to strap heavy. Because the next thing is, is our axial to lateral load. So when we look at this, think about it this way. When I put something vertical and I compress it, there's no lateral force. Because all the force is traveling down through the, the strut. It's not moving. It's just going straight vertically through it. When the strut starts moving at angles, we start putting it out, that force is still there. And what we're looking at is when the strut is at a steep angle, the vertical force compresses over the lateral force. This keeps the basis from being able to move laterally, which keeps lateral strapping from loading. So when you look at this diagram, you see that red paratex strut that I tried to draw. Those green arrows are the actual forces that are traveling down through space through to the to the paradigm and just compressing that lateral force from being able to actually travel at all so it keeps that strut in place the thing that you got to like compare it to is when we start talking about 45 degrees and we'll talk about all this when we get to the 45 degree angle but axial versus lateral when we start taking that base away from that vertical force compression as that base moves away from the compressive force the lateral force gains the ability to start loading the strap so that the farther and the steeper, the shallower the angle gets, the more strapping becomes important because it starts not being able to compress that lateral force and actually loading, loading the strapping that we're putting in place. So when we look at a 75 degree angle, we want to talk about we're still stuck on how we strap it. Now, now we've made a decision that we have to strap this thing. Can I use ratchet straps? For, for the force that I'm looking at, I'm looking at 1,500 pounds. Well, absolutely. When I look at ratchet straps, for a single ratchet strap, I have 3,300 pounds and a three to one safety factor for the 9,900 pound brake and strain. Can I use one ratchet strap even? Absolutely. I could even get away with one ratchet strap with this type of friction. Now, friction changes. Steel to asphalt, this could be steel to snow. So I still have to look at, okay, if it was steel to snow, that reduces that down. Let's say that it's I find an environment with 0% friction. And I actually do have 5,299 pounds. Well, how do I deal with it? Well, I, can I get away with, with a double ratchet strap with a 6,600 pounds and a three to one safety factor? Absolutely, because we're gonna hear people say, well, the synthetic is gonna stretch. Yes, they might. But when we look at what actually is happening is we're having, when we come back to this, we're having this axial force compression that quiets our lateral force. And we're going to show you videos of not strapping vehicles and lifting them at 75 degrees. There's too much axial compression force for the lateral force to start initiating momentum 
and getting away from the vehicle. So we can use a ratchet strap on 75 degrees on this type of friction coefficient. And this is where we're going to hope to be able to give you um, the information on part two in the part two series of actually taking this to the field and experimenting with it so that we can tell people, hey, if you're on snowy or ice that's concrete, use, um, use two ratchets. Use uh, one ratchet when you're on 90 degree day on asphalt with a steel base because now you're at 0.90 percent friction. So let's talk about the next thing, the 60 degree. So now this is kind of where we're going to start seeing some differences. At 60 degree angles, when we're still lifting with this, we have the same format that we had in the last slide. So here's our raker chart. Now everybody's seen this raker chart. This is the one that implies in your fog and your um, Army Corps of Engineers structural collapse fog. And so for every foot of rise, I have seven inches of run and 14 inches of slope. So same thing here. Uh, 10,000 pound, 20,000 pound, or 40,000 pound vehicle on a 20,000 pound hinge lift with 10,000 pounds per side with a six foot insertion. So 10,000 divided by 72 gives me 138.8 is my friction coefficient. So I know that for every inch of strut I have at a six foot insertion, I have 138.8 pounds per inch. So six foot insertion times 14 because that's my slope to find out what my raker is or my Paratech strut, I have 84 inches of strut. So I'm gonna multiply that by 138.8, and I'm gonna get 11,659 pounds. So now my strut just jumped up 1,600 pounds at 84 inches. Now, is that, a, is that a big deal? Well, no, we're gonna go back over that chart. So 84 inches, it's in between six and eight feet. I'm still more than capable of being okay being okay with that strut that paratech strut is totally fine and completely strong we're still a bomb proof strut strut's good so but if i was to increase that and i was to put a really high insertion in i could start coming more towards you know if i put a 10 foot insertion into this big rig we'll look at the 10 feet at 10,000 at 10 feet i'm at 10,725 pounds on a two to one safety factor that's that's getting close. So now I've got a I can't put an insertion at 10 feet on a 60 degree on the 60 degree angle. So at six feet, I'm fine. The next thing to look at is that six as that uh strap. So for every foot of rise, I have seven inches of run. So six times seven is 42. Now I have 42 inches from the vehicle that is creating force at 138.8 pounds. So now I multiply those together and I get 5,829 pounds of force in both directions. So a total of 11,659 pounds of force with 0% friction. So what I did is I took it and I took a different uh, paradigm. I took steel on gravel. So that's 0.40% friction. So I multiplied 11,659 times 4.0 gave me 4,663 pounds. So I subtract that from 116659, and I have 6,995 pounds of total force in both directions. Now that's not incorporating our vertical compression force, right? So we look over here at this axial to lateral forces. Now 60 degrees is still gonna have a good amount of vertical force compression keeping it in place. There'll be a little bit of slipping, and a little bit of loading into those straps, from the bases, those bases will push out a little bit, but once they start a little bit of resistance, they'll start driving in. Those struts will start driving in. So 6,995 pounds. So when we look at that, how do I strap that? That's the strapping decision. I just went from 11,000 to 6,995 pounds with steel on gravel. And so I have 6,995 pounds of lateral force that I have to strap together. Can I do it with a ratchet strap? I have to double up my ratchet straps. So I can get away with a two to one safety factor, 9,900 pounds with this system. Now we're gonna talk about those that stretching again. I've heard this like a lot, no nylon stretch. Yeah, it's gonna stretch. It's, it's gonna stretch until the compressive vertical forces react and then it's not gonna stretch anymore. 
And now you're just having these straps that are getting, being tied together. And that's the important part. So we can get away with this type of load. Now, let's say there was 0% friction. We've, we've gotten rid of friction in the world. And now we have 11,659 pounds of force. And we're coming back up to this uh, non-friction equation where uh, that six times seven is 42 times 138 5, 000, equals 5,829 pounds in both directions. So that 11,659 pounds. If you want to talk about that one, well, that's fine. We still can. Now we start looking at strapping. So if I had 11,659 pounds, I can't use ratchet straps. But I can use chains. Now, this is where we're going to talk about the difference in grades of chains. What we're seeing is we're seeing people put in 120, 100, 80 grade, all of our overhead lifting chain, you throw it on the ground, and we're strapping it into place, and we're getting dirt, salt, muck all over these chains. What I would like to see people start looking at is looking at that 70 grade chain. It's a carbon steel chain. It doesn't have any alloy in it. It's not meant to stretch, and it's truly meant for um, strap downs. It's strapping down heavy vehicles onto flatbeds and transport chain. Well, this is exactly what we're doing here. Now, when I talk about it, when I look at that 11,659 pounds, can I make it work on a four to one safety factor with three eighths and 70 grade? No, because I only get 6,600 pounds. But when we're in rescue mode and it's your chain, you know, and this is something that, you know, I talked with Greg prior, prior about is, um, if it's your chain, if it's from your rig, if you know the connections, if you're not reducing your D over D connections, if you have your uh, self-locking sling hooks or slip hooks and you've got the right grab hooks with the right shoulders and you don't have ratchet systems in it and binders and you're going from base to base and the connections are all right and they're your connections and there's no deduction in your chain because your D over D, D, over D is working perfectly, then you can definitely operate chain in a two to one safety factor for rescue. And so when we look at that 70 grade of two to one safety factor, I get 13,200 pounds. Well, with 0% friction on, on a place that we do not have probably on this planet, you can chain this down and expect it to not move using 70 grade three eighths chain. So the next thing we're gonna talk about is we've we just got done with 60, 75, and you all have assumed that 90 is no lateral forces. So it's just a vertical force and not a big deal for the strut. What people have been taught for so many years is that the best stabilization angle is 45 degrees on passenger vehicles. And the problem that I see with that is when we teach people the passenger vehicle's best stabilization for a buttress system is 45 degrees, we see that transition over into the commercial big rig side it's just like a structure fire we will see residential tactics implemented at commercial structure fires well this is the same thing i don't want to see that and so i'm going to talk to you about 45 degree angles now do i think they make a stable platform absolutely but the problem that i see with people is they'll put it in and just in this picture on the right and this picture on the left um that picture on the left was taken a long time ago but Look at how high and how steep your capture struts are on that freighter front. And then on this bus, look how wide and how tall that insertion height is for the bus. Now, I'm not saying that we will never do that. I'm not a never and always guy. I want people to, when they make a decision to put a 45 degree angle strut in for stability and put it in high, that they recognize how much load they're putting on the strut and how much load they're putting on the strap. It's not something that is in, in it's, it's something that could happen if you have a bunch of vehicles involved in the, in the wreck or jersey barriers, but I just want people to use theoretical based understanding and principles when they do put it in and they put it in for a good reason. So let's look at this, 45 granules. Now I'm gonna walk you through all the parts of this whole um, slide because it's pretty complicated, but this first one is the same thing, 45 degree angle. That's the Raker chart for a 45 degree angle. So for every foot of rise, I have 12 inches of run and 17 inches of slope. And then when we look up here, we've got a same force constant formula, 10,000 pounds, six foot insertion, 
just an arbitrary number, but they're all staying the same height. So that we see the same increase in load. So I'm going to put that strut in at six feet at a 45 degree angle. So I'm going to multiply it by 17. That strut is then becoming 102 inches. So I have a 102 inch strut. Well, I'm going to multiply that by 138.8 pounds and I'm going to get 14,157 pounds. My strut at a 45 degree angle just picked up 4,157 pounds. That's a pretty, pretty substantial amount of pound to pick up. Now let's look at that six foot insertion. So I have six foot, but my strut is actually 102 inches. So just between eight feet and nine, 10 in this chart. So I'm going to go to the eight feet and I got 24,000 pounds on a two to one and 12,000 pounds on a four to one. So if I was operating in recovery and I wanted to be safe, I would have, I will have to reduce the height of insertion to operate in a four to one. So I'd have to come down so that my strut had the capacity for 14,157 pounds. So I have to come down below, I'd have to be at six feet or below to be at a recovery four to one safety factor. Not a big deal. That's easily done. We have to have that fundamental theoretical understanding that how to do that. So now we're going to look at the strapping. The strapping is six, uh, we got a six foot insertion. For every foot of rise, I have a foot of run. So I have six times 12 inches of run gives me 72. So I have six feet of strapping from the load. I'm going to multiply that by 138.8 pounds. So I'm going to see 9,993 pounds of force created in that left buttress as well as in that right buttress. Now I see almost, almost 19,987 pounds of force. Is that true? Well, let's look at just some friction. We'll take the friction out of it. We'll put, for, you know, we'll put friction into it. So we'll do steel on concrete this time. So in the rigor guide, the rigor guide gives you 0.57 is your friction coefficient. So 0.5, sorry, 0.57. 0.57 times 19,987 pounds gives me 11,392 pounds. Well, then I'm going to subtract that 11,000 from 19,000. I'm going to get 8,594 pounds of force. And then in each direction would be 4,327. So I've got to come up with 8,594 pounds of retention force. Now, can I get away with it? with whoop, can i get away with it with a uh with a ratchet strap when i look at a ratchet strap i'm looking to get 8594 pounds at a 45 degree angle with two ratchets i have 9900 pounds of capacity on a two to one safety factor yeah if i'm on steel and concrete if my steel base plate is on concrete i can get away with a ratchet strap at 45 degrees two of them but I'm going to start seeing force loading. I'm going to start seeing more force in this strap. And I'm going to start seeing that strap want to stretch the bigger and heavier the load gets. So I've got to be cautious on here. I've got to talk about our axial forces. When we look at this upper left picture up here, when we put something at a 45 degree angle and we start lifting it, that base plate wants to walk out because it has no vertical force compression really dampering the lateral forces. So we've got to really think about strapping. I've got to find a strap that doesn't that, that doesn't stretch, which is my 70 grade chain. This is where I really believe that when I start utilizing 45 degree angles in my struts, which is not a bad thing, it just increases the forces and I need to understand that. And as I start looking at, okay, well, how do I strap it? I can strap it with ratchets, but I'm going to see stretch. You're going to see this thing want to stretch. So to reduce that from happening with these increased forces, I'm just going to go to 70 grade chain. Because that 70 grade chain, I'm looking at 8,595 pounds. Well, 70 degrees or 70 grade chain at three eighths on a two to one gives me 13,200 pounds and it doesn't stretch. That's kind of where I want to live. When I start utilizing 45 degree stabilization angles, I'm moving to 70 grade chain. Could I move to 80, 100, 120? Yeah, but that's overkill. Plus, carbon alloy steel chains 
are meant to stretch. I don't want stretching. Not that we're going to come up to these levels of force that's going to stretch these. Do we still have friction and all the things in the world that keeps it from, you know, the actual compression that keeps it from really stretching or pushing to those load capacities? But I want to have the chain of, I want to have that 70 grade that doesn't stretch. So let's just look at it if there was no friction. Let's say we were to put it on um, ice. So we have 0.03% friction on ice. And the Paratech base is digging the ice pretty good. Now, what I would always suggest you do if you are working on a highway where a semi-truck crash, it's just as if we were to put our outriggers out at a structure fire to put our aerial up. Um, we're going to dig the ice out from underneath the aerial at, um, outriggers before we put them down so that we can reduce the ability, the want for it to slide. Same thing here. Chip out all the ice. Throw ice melt in and then put your base down. But if for some reason you, don't, you can't and that's not an option. Let's say you had 19,987 pounds of lateral force. Well, how do we deal with it? I've got to move into the into the stronger chains. I've got to move into that um, PWAG, that small three eighths, uh, 10,600 pounds with a six to one safety factor. But you have to have those options on your rig in case that doesn't work. You know, specific frictions aren't help. You know, helping you. So. Have a good chain game, as I always call it. If you look at this picture on this left-hand side, that's the chain game from the heavy that I work on. It's an organized, systematic approach to working big rigs. I've got our 70 grades sitting right on the outside, and then PWAG is next. So the biggest thing to recognize is that you have options, but you've got to recognize that I can't put, just randomly throw ratchet straps on a 45-degree angle when I'm lifting a heavy load. I've got to figure out why I'm lifting or how I'm lifting and what it's, what it's going to do to the strapping. And if I feel like it's going to stretch, then chances are I should just move the chain. So the next thing to look at is that long strut. So at 14,157 pounds, that's the other chart that we have in here is this long short chart. I might have to move from my if I needed to do a six foot or 102 foot insertion, I might need to move to golds. So then we look at golds at almost nine feet. I've got plenty of load on a two to one safety factor to operate a gold uh, nine foot strut at 32,000 pounds on a two to one for rescue. And on a four to one, I have 16,000 pounds. So I can move from gray to gold in this one right now as well. So, Let's talk about 30 degree angles. So 30 degree angles is a pretty amazing angle that if you were to put it in, you would recognize that it just looked wrong. Now this strut at the bottom is at a 30 degrees, this one that's up against this modular home. So for every foot of rise we have on a 30 degree, we have 20 point inches, uh, 20.8 inches of run and 24 inches of slope. So same exact formula, 20,000 pound vehicle, 40,000 pound vehicle with a 20,000 pound inch lift, 10,000 pounds per side, six foot insertion, 10,000 divided by 72 gives me 138.8 in our friction coefficient, or sorry, our force constant. So for a six foot insertion, I'm gonna take six, I'm gonna multiply it by 24, and I'm gonna get 144 pounds, or 144 inches. And now I'm going to take 144 inches and I'm going to multiply it by 138.8. And that's going to give me 19,987 pounds in my strut. My strut just picked up 9,987 pounds. Let me go back here. 19,000 pounds. Why? I need gold struts. I'm no longer in gray struts. Which gold struts can do it. At six foot insertion. No problem. Here comes the problem. For a six foot insertion, I have 20.8 inches of run, which gives me 124 inches from the load times 138, gives me 17,322 pounds of strapping in both directions with 0% friction. So that gives me 34,644 pounds. Now, I can reduce the friction to this and go about going through the math and trying to find out what coefficient I can work with to get it done. But the reality is, do not put a lifting strut or a capturing strut at 30 degrees. 
there's no absolute reason to do it. Even if we were to have, you know, PWAG at 120 at 10,600 pounds on a six to one safety factor, I'm still going to be at only 32,000 pounds if I had 0% friction. Now, add friction to it, I'll have it. But the reality is, is at 30 degrees, there's so little vertical compression force that the friction actually isn't really helping you either because it's acting as a sled. And so you're going to see heightened levels of force. Now, as you can see on this left, somebody can step over that strut. If you can ever step over a strut to talk to the person that inserted it and put it in, kindly explain to them that they need to find a different way to put that strut in. And explain to them that it's not a good idea. Now, as I tell people in class when I put this out, when it's in person, it's definitely more dramatic. But when I'm standing on it and I tell people like, how do you think you would ever put a strut in? And everyone goes, no, that's crazy. That looks that looks way too steep. Yes, it does. But the issue is we've all done it. It's called a strap back. Now, the strap back is the biggest portion of the issue because what ends up happening is the new angle is between the strap and the strut. So if this 30 degrees has this type of impact on the strut at that 19,000 pound impact, well, then the strap back at 15 degrees is the actual angle. So it's double all of that. Now, there's an awesome video that we're going to watch right here that is a, that shows this happening. Strapbacks are definitely something that happens in training, and we're going to look at it right here. San Diego, and what ended up happening is the individuals that were pumping this up, they actually did a strap back, and they strapped it back to the vehicle and the old inner packs the yellow inner packs that um they were a part of this they ended up failing at the coupler and they exploded just like that like you saw in that video it just happened so now everybody turned both. around and blamed the inner packs for not being a strong connection well, what ended up happening is they were chained and strapped back to the upper vehicle, creating these massive forces into that inner pack and then tearing the inner pack apart before it actually Go ahead failed. and lift it. So, so up on both. It's just something to watch out for. 75 degree angle. Oh, there it is. That's that strap back that you see right there. Sorry, I mean, you guys must not have seen it. I'm not sure if you did or not. But this video shows this happening. And so... Let me see if I can play that for you real quick. I don't know if it'll work. Move it back towards the end here. I'm not seeing it work. That's okay. Um, but looking at this just the way that it is right now, when you see that strap back to the vehicle, that is in a, a very shallow angle. So that system failed right at the connection between where the coupler is for the, the gold strut and the inner pack. And that's just basically a hydrofusion, a first generation hydrofusion that has the same capacities as the HFSs do, which is not in an embodied standalone strut. But they are were just as strong. But the thing is, is the theory and principle of strapping back to that vehicle and creating that narrow angle and that um, increased force in the strut and straps is what failed that system. So when we look at this whole thing, so the big thing to look at, I guess, is Paratech set out that rescue strut multiplier chart for everybody. Now, when we look at 75, 60, 45, and 30, we chose to look at the mathematics on all of it based on this chart. So when we look at that axial load, that, that 90 degree, we see that we have 100% of load into the strut and no lateral forces. So when we look at this chart, this is what you have to memorize. All this mathematics on this side, it was just for us to prove to ourselves, to prove to ourselves that the math actually matched. So at 75, I know I have 104% of the load in a vertical axial load. And if you look at 75, we had 10.3, which right there, right at that, what it's supposed to be. 
And then we look at the lateral load, we have 0.28. Well, we have 0.26 in this mathematic at 75. And then we move over to the 60 degree. I've got, on a 60 degree, I have 11,659 pounds of force in that strut, which is actually 1.15 times of load in the 60 degree. And then the lateral force I have in this multiplier should be 0.58. Well, I have 0.58 up here. 0.58 of 10,000 is 5,829 pounds. In the 45 degree mark, I need a 1.41% multiplier. Well, I have a 10,000 pound load that has a 14,157 pound capacity. So I've got that multiplier from that, that, that mathematics is the same. And then the lateral force is one times the load and in 45 degrees, one times the load for the lateral force. And for 30, I have two times the load on the strut, which you see at that 19,987 pounds. And I have 1.73 times the load laterally. Well, right there, I have 17,322 pounds and I have that multiplier in there. That is, that is all true. So some of the things we want to talk about is these videos. Now I'm hoping these videos will work and that they'll share. Go ahead and lift it. So up on both, 75 degree angle. So I'm gonna play this. So this is a 75 degree angle. So 75 degree angle, you guys can see the chains. So the chains that are hanging down, that in some, in retrospect, is your vertical forward pressure. That's what we would look at. That chain is, Basically, drawing an arrow where that vertical force pressure is, and what's it doing? It's right in line with that foot of that of that paratech base. So that paratech base is going to be compressed by that vertical force pressure, and it will not travel laterally because of the compression and the friction. We take pictures, we take videos of this, but the one thing I want to tell you is do not um, do not. Stop. Ever not strap your Load chains. So now I play this video. Off the rear suspension. We're always. It's always important to strap your base. Seventy-five degree angle. No. Please always strap your base. Strictly science only. So laterally, this whole system is force, lifting, and the system is lifting up in the force. air, and it's being sent up through the hydrofusion, and that lateral force compression is keeping it in place. And you can just see it going. I'm just going to speed it up a little bit, just so we can see it. But you'll see. It's more dramatic when I move it like this and I speed it up. As it gets sped up, you will see that it just stays in place. Now this is a 75 degree angle with no strapping, nothing. There's not any reason to put in heavy system chains. Now, if I put heavy chains into this, I'm just wasting chains and putting them on the ground. I'm using my overhead lifting chains for no, I'm destroying them for no reason. So what I want to do is make sure that I always have my, you know, chains for, for overhead lifting uh, controlled and in a, you know, cleaned and taken care of, and I'm not throwing them on the ground for no reason. Now, with this amount of lateral force compression and, or a little bit of lateral force and vertical force compression that's acting on it, I can get away with a ratchet strap. And when people say, well, the ratchet strap's gonna stretch, I'll tell you, it won't, because there's so much vertical compression that's fine. One ratchet strap, if two makes you feel better, then put two in, and you're gonna be fine at 75 degree angles. Now we're gonna go and we're gonna look at the next slide. So we'll look at... Uh, go ahead and lift it. That's so... Up on both, 75 degree angle. We'll look at 65 degrees or 60 degrees. And so I'm gonna hit play. And so what we're gonna see, so before I play it, what you're gonna see is you're gonna see the struts start pushing up, the chain will tighten up and the bases will start compressing in. Now we can see that chain is drawing a line. We took that chain straight down to the ground. It's no longer completely over the foot um, extrication base. It's more of the inside of it. So there's more force that is allowing it to have lateral force. Lateral force is going to create momentum on this. So what you're going to see is you're going to see me come behind and put my foot behind this strut and just stop it from moving. And so I just hit play and we'll see it go. 
So as it's going, oh. you're going to start seeing the hydrogen pump up. Off the rear suspension. And as it's pumping up and pumping up. 75 degree angle, no. We're going to expect this thing to push out. Right? People say, oh, it's at 60 degrees. It's going to start lateral strap force loading. You need to put is compressing 80 grade lateral chain force. in between. No, you don't. What you need to do is understand that friction and vertical compression forces keep these systems together. Now, once again, I'll always keep saying this. I never, you should never not strap your bases. Always strap your bases. Just recognize what you need to strap them with. And this type of friction coefficient, I could get away with two ratchet straps at a 60 degree angle and feel more than fine. The only reason why I'm putting a second ratchet strap in is just really for a good feeling inside. So you'll see me come around and I'll come and put my foot behind that base because the bases are starting to slide out ever so slowly. And when I put my foot behind the base on the right side, you'll see the left foot, left base kick out a little bit. So watch it because it doesn't have anything to hold it. So these, this, this rig is coming up off the ground and it is starting to take the load and you see how it's slipping a little bit but I'm able to hold it back with just my foot on the right side. So yes, a ratchet strap is absolutely necessary in 60 degrees just to keep them in place. And they're, they're necessary all the time. I'm saying, yes, that one will need to have one. And not, if not just one, but two. But then the question is, are they going to stretch? Not at 60 degrees. There's enough force vertical compression to keep them in place. If I can put my foot there and keep it in place while this rig is being lifted in the air, then I think a ratchet strap would be just fine or two to keep it and make the lift successful. So I'm going to go back to this page and I'm going to go back and go to the next one. So the next one will be 45 degrees. So the 45 degree lift. Oops. Go ahead and lift it. If we look at it, we'll just talk so about it for a up second. On both. We're going to look at it and we can see that chain. Degree. Look how far out that base is from where that force vertical pressure is. So that's a lot of space to create momentum. It's a lot of space to change static into kinetic. And so we're going to look at how when we start lifting this, we're going to put our feet behind it. We're going to try to hold it in place, but it's going to still gain lateral force. And it's so it's going to want to move the pieces out laterally and until we come up. So we'll start pumping on it. You can see the hydrofusions are starting to try to start moving, but there's not enough friction. The, the bases are just moving out without any of force on them at all because there's no vertical force pressure. So we'll come put our feet behind it and we'll hold it and we'll get that belly that you see the chain that um, chain that's going to be lifting the load is on us the up. Struts. Off the rear that's suspension. gonna be that's gonna tighten up and we're gonna then angle. start lifting no you'll see that it just it picks up the chain the and chain goes up laterally and then it just vertical falls force. down because there's no way we can hold it lateral force. we could not in any way hold that vehicle up in the air because there's too much lateral force pressure in the system so that's when we start looking at it and we start talking about, okay, when do we put in, you know, when do we, when do we start putting in heavy chain? I would suggest that you start looking at heavier, heavier strapping at 45 degrees and above. Now I'm saying, I'm never going to say never ever and don't do certain things. What I'm going to say is be smart, choose the appropriate strapping, the appropriate strut, steep insertion, shallow struts and lift now the things that happen is people say to me well if i'm lifting from underneath this vehicle if i'm taking this vehicle and i'm lifting straight up like this uh, where do i have lateral stability well we don't we don't have a whole lot a lot of left and right lateral stability in this that's why we'll put outwitting straps so when we come all the way back to this first slide that we show these outrigging straps is my left and right control. I'm going to go back quite a ways, but these outrigging straps right here. You can see that outrigging strap on the bottom portion of that bus. I've got one going the other way. Now, I put them in underneath. I put those struts in shallow insertion and start lifting with them, and I have the ability to pull left and right from that bus. 
I can also tension them up and push up because it's a game of inches. So I'm not going to see massive amount of force. And either one of those straps should be seeing a whole lot of force because when we talk about our force in neutral, when we come to neutral and this bus is in neutral, I'm when I have a strap on the left and right side holding it neutral, there's no force on those outrigging straps. Not a whole lot at all. So when I start pushing this vehicle straight up in the air, when we start seeing, sorry, right, I'll go back here. When I start pushing this bus straight up in the air, we start seeing that left and right drift. And those of you that haven't used outrigging straps, if you don't, you'll see that strut drift left and right. Well, that's great and slope getting the best of you because it wants to move downhill and you didn't account for it. An uphill outrigging strap will keep it from moving downhill. If it's flat and grayed and we're going straight up and we need a lot of room to go up, we need to make a lot of space, well, that left and right outrigger strap keeps it from drifting. As that load gets up in the air, it wants to drift in directions. And those outrigging straps keep it in neutral the entire lift. So that's pretty much the strut class. Okay, that's great. I'd like to thank Tyler for doing the webinar for us on the heavy stabilization. There's a lot of information there for you to take back. Uh, again, my name is Nigel Leatherby. I'm the training manager for Paratech. For those of you who can't stay, have a great day. Uh, for those of you who can, if you can stay for the next 10 to 15 minutes, myself, Tyler, and Mike Woolaberry, the other RSM, will be here to answer uh, questions in the, the question and answer portion of the webinar. Again, for those who've got to go, thank you for attending. Sorry, I forgot to unmute. <laughs> so for the question and answer portion of this, uh, I'm going to read the questions that uh, were asked on the chat. And Tyler's going to answer them to his best ability on that. So Tyler, the first question came from Ottawa, Canada. And the question goes like this. On hinge lift, do we trust inflated tires to be able to hold the increased load? Is it a practice of taking air out of the out so there's no catastrophic change if a tire goes? Um, can you hear me, Nigel? Yes. I had an issue with my yes. uh, microphone. So, okay. Yeah. So the thing to think about, it's like any other size up. You want to make sure that the tire is in good condition and make sure that it looks like it hasn't been affected by the crash, but most semi-truck tires can hold anywhere from 12,000 to 6,000 pounds per tire. And then when we look at the hinge, it is the pivot point, but on a semi-truck, what's gonna happen is we're gonna hinge it into um, the, the kingpin of the fifth wheel more than anything else. So it's gonna separate that load amongst all of the tires on the tractor portion of the fifth wheel. So wouldn't be a huge consideration to really worry about taking down tire pressure when we start doing okay. it. Uh, Eddie Riley asked a question. Uh, I think this goes back to, let me guess, I guess you can increase the FC by staking the plate. Okay, it goes back to the to the strap in most probably. Uh, yeah, so anytime, yeah, Nigel, anytime we put stakes into the ground or we, or we put in additional friction coefficients, which is staking, and we we take away, you know, we normally give 750 pounds per per picket. We start reducing the volume in that lateral force. It starts actually helping us. So yeah, we can picket, we can pull, we can use redheads, we can do all those types of things. Sometimes the pickets and the redheads um, for bolting are even as good because their shear strength is so high than than ratchets. Okay, um, Axit Alex. Lantigua, in a chase and capture situation, can you use the air to chase the load? 
And if so, what pressure should you not exceed on your strut? So yeah, anytime we lift, we put a capture strut in and it's chased by air and it's also manned by the collar thread, the Acme collar thread. So as it's going up, it's, you know, we use a VSK system at 25 PSI for our chase struts. And those chase struts, as the hydrofusions lift, the chase struts go up and we bring down the collars on the hydrofusion as well as the chase strut as it goes. So I had one question from Rescue FF. Would it be possible for Tyler to play us a song in his guitar? <laughs> you don't want that. <laughs> uh, Mary Beth Selma, is there a shortcut sheet recommendations? Absolutely. Um, understand that 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 a Paratech um, angle chart is one directional. So understand that you're putting those forces in both directions and your force and friction will change based on the coefficients that you're involved in. So really the, the thing that we're gonna do, like when I talked about the guys from Michigan with uh, Greg Payer and Carl Hine and Aaron Osborne, is we're gonna go through and we're gonna try to find out really a cheat sheet essentially to look at if I'm coming up on asphalt and I'm coming up on concrete and I'm coming up on gravel and I'm up off the road, what your friction coefficient is. And we're gonna try to work on getting you a, fundamental like sheet or a hands-on sheet that you could actually memorize or, or learn that when you go to these calls, you can just implement that knowing that you're on asphalt in a paratech steel base and what those coefficients are. And you'll know what angles you're at and what strapping you'll need. So that's, I think that's more future to come. And that's kind of the point of us getting together with um, those fellas and really looking at what friction coefficients are in our environment with the Paratech basis and what we can bring to the using end rescuer that can implement it on incidences pretty quick, quickly and okay, rapidly. Dan R, if we decide to use grade seven chain to connect bases instead of grade eight chain, since there's no stretch, could you just use a chain shortener instead of a chain binder as you would with grade eight? Absolutely. But the thing that we want to do is to look at, you know, we're looking at capacity. And so like most uh, three eighths uh, chain shorteners or chain binders, they have, you know, um, a 3,800 pound capacity sometimes, and they don't match the actual chain. What we're looking for is to operate that chain binder or that uh, chain shortener at its highest um, at its highest capacity with all the right connections. And I think what you, what he might be asking is like a sister chain or something else. So let me restate that. You can, you absolutely can use like a chain shortener with two grab hooks on either side and a shorty piece of chain in the middle, but you're just adding complexity to the situation. And what you really want to look at doing is having the right connectors, the self-locking sling hooks on your grade seventies on both sides, and then coming in and just hooking them together and then bringing them to the right angle after you have the connection. Okay. Uh, I think we got a couple more questions here. Ivan Marsh Kauger. Would you guys prefer to use the VSK multi bases with the ratchet struts integrated on them, or would it be better just to use a base place and a hook, a ratchet strap to it? Sorry, yeah, can so, you read that again? I'm trying to would you guys you prefer to use the VSK bases with the ratchet struts integrated on them, or would it be better just to use base plate and hook? and a ratchet strap to it. I. Yeah, so the VSK multi base plate, you, I mean, you, the thing is it's, that's gonna basically look at your, at your residential tactics to commercial tactics. That VSK stabilization um, plate with the ratchet coming out of it, it's designed to hook back to the vehicle. So if we start hooking back to the big rig, we're gonna start creating those forces. So if for some reason we were to lose our lifting load, our lifting capat, our lifting struts, and those were to fail, it was to fall into our VSK tie back straps, then we're gonna overload that strap and we could have a potential failure. So we're looking as that, that capture strut is more of our belay. If you were to look at it as a 
rope rescue. We always put our, you know, we want to make sure that our belay is stronger than our main. So this is the same thing. We don't want to have a weaker product than we have when we're working with uh, extrication bases and have the straps going horizontal to each other and not being strapped back to the vehicle. I think that- I, I, I think that question. question was more related to looking at it, because I'm reading it about four times. Uh, looking at it, it's where the ratchet strap goes to the head and the and it's the ratchet straps on the strut. So you're creating a triangle with the, the actual strap. So the strap comes down from the head to the vehicle, then from the vehicle back to the strut, making that triangle. So more like on an X2 strut versus yeah. a heavy lift capacity. Yeah. I think the only the only problem is with that is that the most of the load then is on your ratchet strap rather than being on your strut. Yeah, I mean, the biggest thing is just, you know, and I don't have, I don't use that strut personally, but the thing is, is if we're, if, like Nigel said, if the strut's not being compressed in some type of vertical axial load and the strap is a part of that vertical, vertical axial load and we're strapping back to the vehicle, we're creating smaller angles, which then are increasing our forces and in our, in our straps. And, and that's something that I wouldn't play around with when it comes to big rig. And I think that that strut that was designed more or less for stabilizing yeah, exactly. passenger vehicles, yeah, exactly. than, uh, larger vehicles. Uh, so Kevin Beans, do we ever need to stabilize the kingpin? If so, how? So that kingpin, that tongue and that kingpin and that um, the closure is good for about 80,000 pounds most of the time. So it, like anything else, we have to look and see what the accident has done to our to our vehicles and if it's compromised then we, then we can strap it down we can ratchet it down we can strap it in place and we can help the kingpin sit in its tongue so it doesn't come out um, all of it is that 360 investigation and looking at what's going to happen if we lift in a certain area anytime we lift move or shift anything we look at where it's going how it's going what it weighs what angle it's at all that stuff's important and so is that investigation portion when you're designing that rescue plan to visualize the kingpin and see how and see if that tongue latch is still secured and make sure that it's in place before we lift. Because if it's not, then we have a potential of either slipping it out or driving it, you know, driving it out. So um, we can always make sure by just a visual inspection with a flashlight, if it is in place, if we're choosing to hinge lift onto it. And if it's not, then to ratchet strap it into place and then make sure that it doesn't. Okay, I got one more question here because I don't see any more after that. It's from Tom Robinson. Tyler, what chain grades and quantities do you carry on your heavy rescue? So we carry a mixture of all of our 70 grade chains for all of our strapping, for bottom strapping of bases. Um, and those give us options for many different things. We make sure that they all have the same um, couplers, same hooks that have the uh, shoulders on it. And then we carry um, 80 grade, um, just like trash chain so we'll carry what we call towing and trash chain that's 80 grade that if we need to put it in a bad situation we are willing to lose it and that's just more or less our our ba products and then we go to our 100 grade gunna bow and we have 100 grade gunna bow and we have sling hooks with it we have two tens and two twenties on that and then we have gunna bow at six feet with all of our self-locking sling hooks and grab hooks with the right shoulders and then we have p-wag um, chain as well which is basically a square link three eighths chain. It's got 10,600 pounds on a six to one safety factor. Um, and then we have a lot of uh, specialty ones. We have our uh, Miller frame rail hooks on half inch chain. And we have um, just some tow hooks that are on, uh, tow chain that are on um, master links with foundries, foundry hooks on them so we can drag things out. Um, and we have a lot of synthetic rim slings that we use as well. So we have a pretty extensive chain game for okay, our- Okay, we just have another rescue. question come in from Canada. If tying, back on, if tying back onto the big rig isn't ideal, what's the best strap attachment point on a hinge lift? Assuming we have, set, we have separately tied back the vehicle and it doesn't go over too far and that we can't access the opposite side. Sorry, I've got to read that real quick again.
Do you guys, I'm, I'm having a hard time well, understanding that. Basically, story. what, what I think he's trying to say is if the vehicle's turned over on a hinge and you can't access access oh. a low point for the strap to go on for your stabilization or your lift, what can you do? Okay, yep, perfect. Um, so picketing is a big thing. So we do a lot of picketing. We carry a, um, 10 pickets on our heavy. And what we look at for those to do is to create that force, that force reduction. We keep steep angles and we put pickets in and we help drive it off of the pickets. We also use redhead connectors. So we'll drill a hole for a five and a half inch redhead and we'll drill it in two and a half inches and we'll set it in place and be the, you know, the lifting point of our base and our bases won't move based on pickets. If we can't get strapping through, we'll go to redheads or we'll go to Okay, pickets. we just had another, another one come in from Dan R. Just for clarification, with the struts, you divide the weight of the lift by two because you're using two struts. But with a chain, that number doesn't get divided since it's only one chain. True. Yeah, I think what you're saying is that our load, when we're doing our force constant, our force constant uh, multiplier, we're taking the load and we're dividing it by two. So if we're doing a 40,000 pound hinge lift, we're all, or a 40,000 pound vehicle, and we're doing a hinge lift, we're lifting 20,000 pounds. And then we're dividing that by two sides because two independent uh, struts are going to be used and each side is going to get 10,000 pounds. And then the next part of the question, if you're using two struts, but when we but with the chain, the number doesn't get divided since it's only one chain. Yeah, so that chain, that force is being created from left laterally and right laterally on one chain. Yep. Okay, I think that may be it. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody for, for watching the webinar today. Again, I'd like to thank uh, Tyler, thank Mike Ulaberry, the Paratech uh, representative uh, out west. And remember, if you want to see anything that you saw on the webinar today, contact your local Paratech RSM. And he'd be more than happy to put you in contact or do it himself to come out and do the demo. Again, thank you all. Thanks for coming. And we'll see you again on the flip side. Thanks everyone, appreciate you attending. If you have a chance to ever catch a class uh, with Tyler and Rescue 4 Operations, uh, I would highly suggest it. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Thanks, Nigel. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Mike.